The conversation we're going to be having today uh, is actually the most asked question of the people of Grace Bible Church, and it's about revelation. Ooh. Uh, yeah, revelation was the most asked question of all the folks that were here at Easter weekend. Now, there was a variety of questions about Revelation, but a lot of people just wrote the word Revelation on their uh, card. There, there's definitely a lot of mystery that surrounds Revelation, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But before we do, I told you that each week before we get into our main topic of discussion, that we would answer a couple of other questions that didn't make the cut, if you will, that there just weren't enough people that asked those questions for us to talk about it in the large uh, as a whole sermon, but definitely important questions for us to answer. So here's a couple of the questions that didn't get asked as often that one of these might be your question, all right? Great question right here. So we've got Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. Which one are we supposed to pray to? Good question. Uh, scripture tells us, uh, the book of John says it a lot. Uh, the book of John says it in chapter 10, chapter 14, and chapter 1. Jesus himself says, I and the Father are one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, though they operate in different functions, they are all the same being. It is God himself that the, the big fancy word would be manifests as three different uh, three different personalities, if you will, three different roles um, that, that he plays, but it's still the same guy. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We call that the Trinity. It's something we believe as a church, which most, most evangelical churches believe in the Trinity, that, that it's God in three persons, basically. Um, so uh, which one are you supposed to pray to? Pick one. Whichever one will be just fine. You're talking to the same guy. Um, sometimes my prayers start out, Father God. Sometimes they start out, Dear Jesus. Sometimes they start out, Spirit of the living God. Sometimes I just address God, uh, a different person of God, different times that I'm praying, and that's okay. I will say that oftentimes my prayer end, quote, in Jesus' name. Uh, and, and that's really just because we see all throughout the New Testament the power that is in the name of Jesus. And we are even encouraged in the New Testament to pray in the name of Jesus because there's power in that name. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that at the name of Jesus, that every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, that God gave him a name that is above every name. So while I may pray to God differently or to God the Father, Son, and Spirit, I typically in my prayers in Jesus' name, and so I encourage you to do the same. I hope that that uh, helps clarify that particular question. Uh, another question, uh, this will be the last one we do before we dive into Revelation. Um, I've actually heard this one a lot over the years. It's a great question. It says, if, if God's word says, quote, by his stripes I am healed, or we are healed, why are not all who ask healed? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, there's two different places in the scripture where that phrase that, that, that you used, if you ask this question or if you're wondering this, by his stripes we are healed, there's, there's two different places where this pops up. Uh, one of them is in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 through 7, and it says this. It says, he, Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. All right, so let's just look at that verse real quick. Here's some just basic hermeneutics for us as a, as a, as a church. Uh, let's have a look, um, or I should say exposition, probably a better word. Um, so he was pierced for our transgressions. So that was one, his, he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sins or our iniquities. The punishment that he took on that brought us peace, it was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Essentially by his stripes we are healed is the conclusion of everything that was just said. To say that Jesus paid the penalty, he took the lashes for us. So that, that whole passage didn't have anything to do with our physical healing, did it? It had to do with healing us from transgressions and sins. 
What he's talking about is Jesus paid the price so that we could not be healed physically, but so that we could be healed spiritually, which is immeasurably more important um, than feeling better or than having that disease that you are carrying go away. Um, there's a disease called sin that runs a whole lot deeper that has eternal consequences. That's what Jesus came to heal. We also see a similar passage of scripture in 2 Peter chapter two. I'm gonna just start in verse 21. I'm kind of jumping into the middle of the conversation. It says, uh, for to this you have been called, O Christian, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps when you are suffering, essentially is what he's saying. He committed no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. But when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him, God, who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds or by his stripes. You have been healed. What's that passage talking about? The exact same thing. Every time we see that phrase, by his stripes we are healed in scriptures, it is not a timeless promise from God that because of what Jesus did for us that we're gonna get physical healing every time we ask for it. But it is a promise that if we would turn to Christ, if we would repent and surrender our lives to Christ, that the price that he paid would in fact set us free from the disease of sin, that we would be spiritually healed, and that's the promise. But let me ask you a question, Grace Bible. Is God still in the miracle healing business? Or is that just some Old Testament thing? He's still a healer. It is so much a part of who he is. What, what I don't know uh, is that I, I can't guarantee when and who and how God is gonna bring a healing, but as you well know, not all of us get physical healing this side of heaven, do we? One thing is certain that all throughout scripture that God, just like in this passage I just read to you, that God uses suffering for his glory. That's not the pretty stuff of Christianity that, that we hope to hear when we come to church. We wanna hear about how, no, God wouldn't want you to suffer if you're a Christian. That's not true. Jesus himself suffered. I mean, he was the centerpiece of all of Christianity and he suffered and Isaiah says that, that it even brought God pleasure to crush the son because he saw the greater good that was gonna come out of what was happening on that cross. So I want you to know that even as, the, even as James says that God wants to use our suffering for his glory, and yes, God is still in the miracle healing business, so keep praying towards that in your life, but I hope that you can get to a place in your faith that you're not thinking that praying for healing is gonna arm twist a yes out of God but that you get to a place in your faith where you know that whatever God decides for you in your journey, that you are still gonna give him glory with everything that you are. That is the ascent of faith that we need to aim for, okay? So, uh, but, but I do know that uh, m many of you, I mean, it, it, as many as folks have heard me talk about this weekend, I know that many of you are probably carrying some pretty significant infirmities in your life, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever. Listen, you're not on your own. We wanna be a part of that journey with you. Uh, we, we wanna be obedient to James chapter five as the elders of the church to anoint you with oil and lay hands on you and pray that you may be healed just out of obedience to God and then we'll leave the rest up to him. I hope that helped answer that question. If you have any other questions about either one of those two, be happy to have a, a private conversation with you about it. But now let's talk about revelation. Uh, this, as I said, was the most asked question of all the people here at GBC. Uh, Revelation, definitely the strangest book in all the Bible. Okay, let's just be honest. Let's get on the same page here. Uh, it is, it's strange. It's really strange when you read it. It, def it, it doesn't really make sense at face value. Like there, there must be something more that we need to know about it. Uh, Revelation is probably also the book of scripture that is surrounded by the most speculation and the least amount of understanding. There are brilliant minds who love God, who have surrendered themselves to Christ Jesus, who totally disagree on the translation of Revelation. And a lot of that is because God speaks to us through pictures and images to reveal what it is that he's trying to reveal. So we wrestled over kind of how to handle this this weekend, how to answer some of these tough questions in Revelation, because honestly, 
the deeper we go to answer some of the questions, the deeper we're gonna have to go in order to answer even more questions. So the right way for us to approach this as a church family this morning is we wanna talk about two major things as it pertains to the book of Revelation. Number one, uh, I'm hoping that you leave here with a right understanding of the context of the book of Revelation and the right understanding of the purpose as to why God gave it to us. All right, so uh, there's probably three major, um, three major, for those of you that have even given Revelation a try, I would, I would guess that there's probably three major um, categories of people in the room today uh, of those who have given Revelation a try. Uh, category number one, uh, that you feel like you have a pretty good handle on it because of popular media. Uh, case in point, the Left Behind series. How many of you have heard of that before? The book, the movies, Left Behind. Um, so those of you that really engross yourselves in those books and watch those movies, you probably feel like you've got a pretty good handle on kind of end times talk and what's going to happen. Let me just tell you on behalf of Tim LaHaye, the guy who wrote those books, that those are all fiction. Um, while they are motivated by some truths, the point of those books is not to reveal truth to you. Uh, it's fiction. The reason why Tim LaHaye wrote those books, I actually knew him personally for a season of my life. He was a board member of an organization that I served on. We ate ham and cheese sandwiches on a park bench twice. Uh, and he would talk about this. Like he wrote this stuff not to try to reveal truth to people. He wrote this to try to set the hook in people that wouldn't dare darken the doors of a church to hear actual biblical truth. If he can catch them in a movie theater or with a top selling book, it might spark enough interest in them to actually come in to a Bible believing evangelical church to hear the truth of the word of God. But the left behind is all fiction. Okay, now some of it might play out like that, some of it might not, but that wasn't his point. The point was he was trying to narr uh, narrate and animate um, what God's word says so that it reaches a mass audience to get their attention. So that's probably group number one. Most of our understanding is based on movies we've watched or books that we have read. Uh, the second group uh, who has given Revelation a try, you, you probably read it once, got weirded out, and don't plan on ever picking it up again. Group number two, group number three, um, you've read it a hundred times and you obsess over it. Uh, you can't even flip on the news now without looking through the lens of Revelation when you watch the morning news thinking, oh, there it is, there it is, and you start Facebooking with some scripture of Revelation next to it. What we wanted to offer you this weekend is a, is a fourth, much more reasonable alternative of knowing and understanding the book of Revelation. Um, our goal this weekend is not that you ever become such scholars that you understand 100% of the book of Revelation. Quite frankly, uh, most people walking the face of the earth will lay their heads in the grave not having a full understanding of the book of Revelation. There are pieces that are very mysterious that we're just gonna have to trust God with it. But if you could leave here this weekend having a right understanding of the context of the book of Revelation and the purpose of why God gave it to us, at least you'll be wearing the right lenses when you dive back into it to give it a look. So let's talk about context first. Now, some of you have just turned me off because I said, we're going to start this conversation with context. You're thinking, Dustin, I hate it when you make your sermons to be like we're sitting in a college class and like learning information. No, context is important, so don't check out. Check back in. Has anybody ever taken you out of context before? Anybody ever? Maybe. Okay, maybe they even quoted your words exactly. Maybe they didn't just foul up everything you said. Maybe they actually said exactly what you said. However, they interjected their own facial expressions and vocal inflections into what you said, totally changing the meaning of what you meant. You hear what I'm saying? Stuff can get thrown way out of context if you just have the wrong look on your face when you say it, can't it? Imagine how God must feel. You think keeping a conversation in context when you're arguing with your spouse is hard enough. Just imagine God writing us a love letter that was ancient, gave it to us a couple of thousand years ago, and here we are in the 21st century trying to translate it into the 21st century context. Just imagine how easily we can take it out of context. So our job, our first job ever when we're approaching the word of God in the 21st century context is we gotta dive in and figure out 
what the right context of that book, that passage is. And that's partly why we're here to help. We hope that you get to a place in your journey with the Lord that you start to understand how to unpack that on your own. And we're gonna start providing resources here in the coming years, some classes to help teach you about uh, exegesis and hermen hermeneutics and all this stuff we do on the weekend and teach you how to unpack God's word. But for now, we're gonna use a stage to really frame things up in context. Listen, if you... We have to take the context of God's word seriously if we claim to take the message of God's word seriously. It's either both or nothing because you'll miss the message if the context isn't right, if you don't understand what in the world God was actually saying when he said what he said. So as we begin this conversation this morning about revelation, let's start in this difficult area of, area of context to set the framework up right. Uh, the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to look at God's Word, and we're going to read the beginning of the book. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 through 8 will set the tone for what the whole rest of the book is about. So let's check this out together. Chris, would you mind grabbing me a bottle of water out of there? I think I left my cup in the men's bathroom. <clears throat> Here you go. Revelation chapter one, verse one through eight. This is gonna be interactive. I wanna hear from you, so get ready to respond, okay? This is the revelation of, you say his name. Jesus. Something tells me heaven says it with a lot more enthusiasm than you just did. Thank you, sir. Listen, this is the, according to Philippians, this is a name that God has given that is above every name. This is the name that one day every knee is gonna bow and every tongue is gonna confess and confess that this guy is Lord and Savior over all. Hitler will be in the crowd, everybody will be there confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is a big name right here, the biggest name in all of eternity that split time right in half. So let me read this again. This is the revelation of, you say his name. Jesus Christ. I felt that one which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of, say his name, Jesus. even to all that he saw. Now blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, that would be me. <laughs> and blessed are those who hear it. That will be you. And who keep or obey what is written in it, that will be all of us. For the time is near. Now John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from, you say his name. Jesus the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. If my count is correct, Jesus' name or reference to, references to Jesus in the first eight verses of Revelation showed up about 25 or six times. Jesus is the central figure and all of creation and all of God's word, and that doesn't change when we roll into the book of Revelation. He is the central figure of the entire book. This book's all about him. Believe it or not, it's not all about us. This is about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now one of the problems is um, when we step into examining this book, we 
totally disregard that first section that set the tone to let you know that Jesus is the central figure of everything that you are about to read, who he is, what he has done, who you are as a result of him. And we look at the book of Revelation through the lenses of it being about us. Literally, our big takeaway when we dive into the book of Revelation all too often is, what can I do to make sure that I don't take the mark of the beast? How will I know who the Antichrist is going to be? Is it Trump? Is it Obama? Is it... I heard that there's supposed to be a rapture. If so, what's going to happen? When's it going to happen? We make this book all about us. It has nothing to do with us at all. We're just a sub point to the whole book of the revelation of Jesus Christ and his victory story for all of the ages. This is all about him. So now that we know who the book is about, the question is, then who is it written to? Verse 4 of Revelation chapter 1, we read it, says the Apostle John wrote this to the seven churches. Now, those seven churches are listed in verse 11. We'll look at that a little bit later. But yeah, the, believe it or not, uh, that Bible that you hold in your hands, the Bible that we're reading together this morning, it was written by a bunch of dead guys to a bunch of dead guys. Um, this, this Bible, this holy love letter of God was not written to you, but it was written for you. But in, under, in order to understand what in the world God is trying to say to you, we have to understand what in the world he was saying to them. He was writing to the seven churches. We need to get out from under the illusion this morning that Genesis through Jude were books written to those people back then that we can learn from by reading it and that Revelation was written to us. No, that's not true. Revelation was just as much written to them as Genesis through Jude. Now, in Revelation, there are some things that have happened, that are happening, and that will happen. So there's definitely some things in Revelation that pertain to us that wouldn't have totally pertained to them. But one thing I can tell you is, if what you are perceiving when you're looking at the book of Revelation would not have made sense to them back then, chances are you're probably missing the whole point of whatever it is that you are looking at in the book of Revelation. Now this is really important as it pertains to every single book in the Bible, but especially as we're looking at Revelation because this is the one that again when we flip on the morning news and we see the devastation in the world around us that we immediately think, oh, which verse in Revelation does this one have to do with? And you can see how quickly we can throw things way, way, way out of context. Uh, this might be news to some of you guys. Um, Jesus is closer to coming than he has ever been before, and he is coming very, very, very soon. But keeping your eyes plastered to your TV screens and looking at the clouds, looking at the devastation of the world and thinking, oh, today's the day. Uh, did you know that the world has always been a devastating place to live? Just ask Adam and Eve. Just ask Cain and Abel. Just ask Noah. Just ask Abraham. Just ask David. Just ask Jesus. Just ask the Jews. The world has always been a devastating place to live. What we're seeing is not anything new. As Solomon says, nothing new is under the sun. Listen, God is up to something more than we could ever imagine, ask or imagine, and his timeline is perfect, and it doesn't always make sense to us, and we need to walk in light of his promises and what his word has says to us, but you need to, we need not to get lost in the clouds and start majoring in the minors and stay focused on Jesus Christ, the very centerpiece of this whole thing, this whole love story that God has given us. Let's zoom in a little bit further on context before we back all the way out and talk about purpose. Some of y'all are tired about context already. Don't get tired yet, okay? There's three things you need to know about the book of Revelation, what the book of Revelation is, okay? I want you to look to the person to your right and I want you to say, it's a letter. Some of you need to look to your other right. That was the wrong your right is that one. Yeah. Number one, it's a letter. Look at the person to your left and say, it's a letter. Yeah, the book of Revelation is a letter. I didn't make this up on my own. It actually says right there in chapter one. Surprise, surprise. Setting the tone for the whole book. Revelation chapter one, verse 11 says, Jesus is speaking to the apostle John and he says, write these things in a book and send it to the, who's that? The seven churches that actually existed. This isn't some hypothetical, theoretical 
uh, imaginary churches, there literally was a church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And believe it or not, they were all on the same mail route and they are listed in the order of which they would have been on the mail route. This actually existed. The Apostle John is writing the revelation of Jesus Christ as a word to them. And a letter, when it arrived at a church, what they would do is, during a worship service like this, this is why it says, blessed is the ones who read it out loud and hear it and walk with it. The letter was to be read aloud during a worship service for a couple of reasons. To give people hope in the midst of the calamity that they were facing in their world at the time, just like we are today. But also to give people instruction so that they knew how to walk in light of the promises that God had given them in preparation for the end of all things. Yes, it was a letter. Uh, the second thing is, this probably won't surprise you, you could have guessed this, the book of Revelation is also number two, it's a prophecy, say prophecy. Prophecy, now prophecy, speaking of context, uh, prophecy Excuse me, prophecy this day and age has taken on a whole new meaning in our culture. The word prophecy, I should say. Namely, when people hear the word prophecy, excuse me, the, Chris must have brought me some of that water with bubbles in it or something. Mainly when, you, when, the, um, pro, uh, when people hear the word prophecy this day and age, they think of predicting the future, right? You hear somebody say a prophecy, you're thinking of, somebody that can predict uh, the future. But while foretelling, which is predicting the future, while foretelling definitely has a part to do with prophecy, prophecy is a whole lot more about forthtelling than it is foretelling. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, prophecy has a whole lot more to do with foretelling than it does foretelling. In other words, here's how I'll put this for you. Most biblical prophecy, most biblical prophecy has less to do with predicting and more to do with proclaiming. Here's how we see and we know that Revelation is about that as well. We read that in verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy or this proclamation. And blessed are those who hear it and who keep it or obey it, what is written on it, for the time is near. It's really hard to be obedient, to hear and obey uh, something that was predicted, but we can definitely hear and obey something that has been proclaimed if that makes any sense. To speak the truth uh, as it is, that would be a proclamation. So that's two. Number three, number three, you'll like this word. You've seen movies all about this. There's a whole lot of zombie movies about this right now. Um, number three, the book of Revelation is not only a letter, it's not only a prophecy, but it is an apocalypse. Fancy word. Apocalypse, that just feels good to say it. Say apocalypse. Apocalypse, yeah. Now, when most people hear the word apocalypse, this is yet one of those things that has been kind of thrown out of whack in our culture. When you hear the word apocalypse, you think of a, a, of a time period, uh, specifically the end times or the zombie apocalypse or whatever. You think of it like that, but apocalypse actually comes from a Greek word. Here you're going to learn some Greek that you'll remember this one, okay? The Greek word for apocalypse is apocalypses. There you go, there's your Greek for the day. What apocalypses means, what they meant in this book right here is to, uh, an apocalypse means that to unveil, to show, or to reveal. That's what it means. This is where we get the word revelation. It means that something was re revealed. And so this is what the book of Revelation is. This is God revealing something to us. I get this from chapter one, verse one and two, for those of you that wanted a scripture reference. This is God revealing something to us that we need to know in light of his glory and in light of our current situation as those who are walking with him. But now the interesting thing about this particular apocalypse this particular unveiling or revelation is that God chose to do it using pictures and images and illustrations, and that's when it gets really confusing. This is why context is so important, and this is why I said earlier, 
if what you are perceiving out of the book of Revelation is not something that would have made sense to the original audience that it was written to, you have probably missed the point. Understand that most of these images we see in the book of Revelation that we get hung, hung up on and confused with, most of those images don't make a whole lot of sense to us. We can't connect to those things emotionally. We, Honestly, when we hear about the angels that have eyes all over their heads and heads like lions and oxen and six wings, and we're thinking, this does not look like the heaven I wanted to go to. This looks more like a horror flick. Um, we forget, we're not accustomed to how that imagery plays into our world, but we forget a basic, simple truth that these people would have understood in that time. I've talked about it several years ago. We did our series called The Eight Things Biblical Writers Thought You Knew. One of those things was, when you're reading these ancient Hebrew and Greek writings, that in their world, and their culture, they describe things as function over form. That's how you remember it, function over form, where in our world, we describe things form over function. If, if I told you to describe me, hey, what did you see? When you were at such and such a place, you would describe to me the form of things. You describe what it saw, what it looked like, what the weather was like. You would tell me what it looked like. But in their culture, they wouldn't describe what it looked like, they would describe what it did. All right, now that may be unclear, let me try to clear it up like this. Let's go back to our little angel analogies. Angel with eyes all over his head, six wings, and head like a lion, or head like an ox, and it's like, whoa! We see something in our heads like, wow, angels are hideous beasts. I don't really know what angels look like, but I'm confident that that's not what they look like because again, they were describing function over form. They weren't trying to tell you what it looked like. They were trying to tell you what it does. These angels, they have eyes all over their head, meaning they are constantly aware of what God is telling them to do, beckoning them to do, and they've got plenty of wings that are ready to serve to carry out his will at any moment. They're describing what the angel does. Here, here's one that's a little bit easier. We understand all throughout God's word, even in the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, to pay the price for our sins. Now the book of Revelation describes Jesus as the lamb of God. We use that imagery enough in the church that if, as you've, if you've grown up in church or if you're, if you're not new to the conversation, which I know some of you are, that when we describe Jesus as the Lamb of God, you don't get a picture of Jesus being a sheep because you just know how that analogy plays into the truth of God's word. Keep in mind when you're looking at the book of Revelation, uh, this is really important to keep at the front of your mind, the truths of Revelation should always be taken seriously. The truths of Revelation should always be taken seriously, but they shouldn't always be taken literally. The images, whether angels have eyes all over their heads, I don't know. But I know that Mary and Joseph had an encounter with an angel. Joshua had an encounter with an angel. He didn't describe them looking so scary. Um, though they were terrified when they saw these angels, they were big, powerful creatures that God sent down. Uh, Jesus being the Lamb of God is another image of that, how that plays out. Here's another one. Book of Revelation, how function over form when you're looking at this, keeping, taking the truth literally, but not taking the image literally. Uh, Revelation speaks of a woman that sits upon seven hills. You wanna talk about Jenny Craig? Like, that's a big girl. function over form. They're not trying to describe to us that there's some woman so large in the book of Revelation that literally that her, her, her butt spreads to multiple mountain peaks. No, it's not it. It's actually describing the city of Rome that was built on seven hilltops. Just another simple example. Now, we could, we could literally could go on with these for hours and these are a lot of fun, playing the illustration analogy game. And honestly, that's where most of us get hung up. And, and so I don't wanna just leave you hanging. This isn't the main point of the book of Revelation, but this is definitely a tool uh, to help. That's why I wanna bring it up. But uh, we wanted to give you a resource before you leave here today. It'll be at the info booth on your way out of here. Uh, I wish I was smart enough to produce this on my own. I'm not. Uh, this was actually written and produced by a guy named Dr. J. Scott Duvall. Um, 
and he uh, produced this thing that we're giving to you, and it's called the cast of characters in the divine revelation. The, the cast of characters in the divine drama of Revelation. And in this, it's almost like a glossary. So he takes like some of the big images that create a lot of confusion, things like the beast from the earth, the great cities, the four living creatures, 666, 144,000, the seven stars, the seal of the living God, all the things that don't make a whole lot of sense to us in our culture. And he breaks it down in layman's terms and gives you scripture, scripture references so you know exactly what it is you're looking at while you're reading it, okay? So this is our resource to you. They'll be sitting on the info booth on the way out. I'd encourage you to grab one of these. This will be helpful. Uh, and again, if you have other questions as you are studying through it, uh, we'd be happy to answer your personal questions privately instead of talking about it in the large scale in here. So uh, that's probably enough about context. Let's back out of that and let's talk about purpose because it's the whole reason why God gave it to us to begin with. Since we are so far removed from the original writing of the text, we have to spend a lot of time on context. But let me tell you, the purpose, what the people in the first century, those seven churches, what they would have heard when they read through this is what I want you to hear today, the purpose of the book of Revelation. Uh, how many of you like to read, by the way? Book readers in the room? Excellent. I'm going to take a wild stab that most of you that read books or even listen to audio books, that you don't diligently read through the whole book and stop right before the last chapter and just put the book away. You don't do that, do you? Yeah, you may stop way early, but you're not going to get that far. You're not going to be on the edge of your seat through every chapter of the book and then just leave the last one undone. Why? Because that's when the prince slays the dragon to rescue the damsel in distress. That's when the princess kisses the frog and he becomes a prince. That's when the soldier becomes the war hero. Like this is the culmination of everything that the book has been building up to. This is like the, the shining moment, the grand finale. This is the part that you're excited about and you're biting your fingernails off to try to figure out what's going to happen. Like how's this thing going to... And this is when the whole meaning of the whole book gets laid bare before your eyes. And let me tell you, the Word of God is no different. It is framed up exactly the same way. The book of Revelation for us is the grand finale to the whole story. This is when the hero of the day steps in and fixes everything, rights every wrong, becomes the valiant warrior who wins. This is what the book of Revelation is for us. This is when God defeats all of the enemies, when he rescues his people, when he restores his creation, and when he comes to live with us again. This is when God, King victorious, when God wins. He could have done it last year, last month, 10 years ago, 100 years ago. But yet God the Father is up to doing something. There are many souls in the world still wandering aimlessly and lost, and it is by his grace that he waits on sending Jesus. It is by his grace that he tarries before coming to get his church because there are so many lost that need to hear the good news of Jesus. We need to pray for them, but eventually God will wait no longer and he will come and get his church, his bride, those faithful followers of Jesus Christ and God will win. He's gonna set the record straight. He's gonna fix every broken thing. He's gonna heal everything wounded and fix every disease and he's gonna set things right finally. Finally for his glory and for our, the church, the followers of Jesus for our good. I want you to see though how Revelation contrasts to the book of Genesis. This is, this is, the, this is the story of humanity. From in the beginning God created to the final end of Revelation when we are in a new heaven and a new earth with the Savior Jesus and God the Father and all the saints for all of eternity. And I want you to see how God contrasts between Genesis and Revelation this victory story that he is planning on and participating in that you and I get to be a part of. Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heaven and the earth, and in no time it is cursed by sin. But in Revelation 21, he creates a new heaven and a new earth where there is sin is nowhere to be found. 
Genesis chapter 3, Satan introduces sin into the world, but in Revelation 19, Satan and sin are judged by God once and for all. Genesis chapter 3, sinful people are ashamed of God's presence, but in Revelation chapter 2, the people will see his face. In Genesis chapter 3, sin brings pain and tears, but in Revelation 21, God comforts his people. He removes their pain, and he wipes away every tear. Genesis chapter 3, the people rebel against the true God, resulting in physical and spiritual death. But in Revelation chapter 20, God's people risk death to worship the true God and thus experience real and authentic life in him. Genesis chapter 3, sinful people are banished from the presence of God. But in Revelation 21 and 22, those who are in Christ Jesus, God will come to live amongst them as his people. Genesis chapter 11, sinful people are scattered, but in Revelation 19, God's people unite around his throne to sing his praises. Genesis chapter 6, a flood of water was used to destroy wicked humanity, but in Revelation 21 and 22, God quenches our thirst from the water of the spring of life. Throughout the whole Bible, Satan deceives and accuses humanity. But in Revelation chapter 20, the devil will be thrown into hell and will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever. Since the days of Genesis to the very own lives that we live right now, things have been really messed up. But in Revelation chapter 21, Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, behold, I have come to make all things new. Genesis chapter three, sinners were exiled from the garden of Eden, but in Revelation 19, the followers of Christ are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Genesis chapter three, death entered into the world, but in Revelation 20 and 21, death is put to death once and for all. Man, this is good news. Yes, the book of Revelation is all about hope. And yes, the wicked will be judged, and yes, Satan will be dealt with, and yes, the unfaithful, those who weren't followers of Christ, they will be eternally condemned, but that is not what the book's about. This whole story is about the hope that we have and the central figure of the whole story, and that's Jesus Christ. This whole book is a reminder to the persecuted church, to those of you that are wearily going through this battle called life that you are worshiping faithfully and you are following the king victorious and that he reigns still on the throne and he's in control of all things and he is coming back to set the record straight. You just need to hope and wait on him in that. And this is about hope and this is really, really good news. I can't say it enough for all we know. Jesus might have just went to the stables of heaven and started brushing down his white horse. For all we know, Gabriel might be in the band closet getting his trumpet out, shining that baby up. For all we know, the angels in heaven might have retreated to the locker room to put on their battle armor. For all we know, God's already given the commission and everybody in heaven's just lining up to break heaven wide open and come and get his church. Because it's coming and it's coming soon. And I can tell you that I know that because Christ Jesus himself has promised it over and over and over again, not only in the flesh, but throughout his word. And God has made a lot of promises throughout history and he has kept up with every single one of those promises. Just ask history, just ask science. They're just catching up to what God has been doing for a long time and everything that God has said in his word that has spoke of history is historically accurate. Everything God has spoken his word about science has been scientifically accurate. Nothing in the word of God has ever been disproven. And so when he tells me, oh, faithful saint, persevere. Hang on. Keep pursuing me. Keep worshiping me because I'm coming back. I know for a fact that he is. And that time is coming soon. The question is, is do you know him? Because it is only those who know the Savior Jesus that he will recognize. Your banner will be clear 
that you are a saint of the living God. Do you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? I would encourage if you do not, would you find me and talk to me about that? I, I'm not going to call you down front or have you walk an aisle or pray some prayer. I, I just, if you don't know Christ Jesus, don't, don't be foolish enough to leave here today without us having this conversation. Because I want your banner to be clear and I want your conscience to be clear because when Savior breaks those clouds wide open, I want him to recognize you. Because he's sure enough going to recognize me. I'm going to make sure of it. That's not based on the works of my hands because I'm a failure, a feeble jar of cracked clay at best on my best day of performing for God. But I have great faith and great hope that the great work that Jesus did on the cross for my sins, paying for them and canceling that debt, that if I would just surrender myself to him, that that promise is made true for me and it can be made true for you. Are you that person this morning that needs to say, yep, I'll take that, I'll surrender that to Jesus. I'm gonna give myself to him because I believe it and I want it. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. If you're that person this morning and you know you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but today is the day and you're ready to stop playing games, would you just slip your hand up for just a second? I'm not gonna bring out the keyboard or even take a lot of time doing this, but I just, I just know there's somebody in this room that feels the pressure right now of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's that awkward feeling you feel right now. That's, what, that's, what the spirit, that's the Spirit of God. That's God himself tapping you on the shoulder, saying, yeah, you're the one, it's time to get serious. Uh, is there anybody in this room that you'd slip your hand up long enough that I can see you? I see you. God bless you. I see you all the way in the back. God bless you. I see you right there on the fourth row. God bless you. Anybody else? I see you over here, ma'am. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see you over there, ma'am. God bless you. Anybody else? I see you way over there on the side, brother. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, Chris, would you, uh, or do, would you handle this for me, brother? Um, Father, I thank you for the great work that you have done. I thank you that we serve the king victorious, that we don't have to wander, God, that we just continue to pursue you and continue to walk faithfully with you. And you, you will set the record straight. It's not our job, that's yours. And we trust in that assurance. We thank you for the hope that we have in Revelation, the grand finale of the whole love story of God to man, that you, in fact, win, that you conquer everything wicked and you make right everything that's broken. And God, we put our full assurance in that work that you are doing and have done on the cross through Jesus Christ, Lord. And we, we confess him as Lord God and we confess him as our Savior. And I thank you for the six or seven in here that have raised their hands in acknowledgement that they needed to make that transition from death to life and surrender themselves to this Savior, Jesus. And for those of you that did raise your hand, uh, as well as the rest of the congregation, would you just pray this prayer along with me? Nothing magical about this prayer, but I just want you to pray a, I'm going to just guide you through a prayer of confessing Jesus as Lord and surrendering yourself to him. Just in case you, you haven't prayed before and you're uncomfortable with that, let's just, just let me lead you in this. You can just repeat after me in your own heart, Father. I thank you for your love for me. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. And I trust you. And I trust the work that Jesus did for me so that I could be set free, so that my sins could be forgiven, so that I could be one of your children. God, I confess that you are God and I am not. And I'm a sinner in need of a savior and you are it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, before I, before I, yeah, let's celebrate the. Look at here, let's end with this. Uh, let's just fast forward to the end of the book, the end of the story. I'm gonna read a little bit from you from Revelation chapter one, verse two through seven. 
this is what's coming. This is good. This is really good. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. How beautiful. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more and neither shall their mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. But he who is seated on the throne has said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. It will cost you nothing because Jesus paid it all. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That is good news, church, and that is. Don't get lost in the weeds. That is the story, the love story of God to man in Revelation. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next weekend as we address a tough, tough topic. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We'll see you then.